Right, so now for something a little bit different. I'm going to talk to you about uh, what appears to be a horrifically complex mess, uh, which I know isn't good for uh, synthetic biology, but I want to give you some reassurance that I think we can start to make sense out of all of this mess. So, as I'm sure many of you know, plants make a huge array of different chemicals, and these are the chemicals uh, that protect plants against pests and diseases. They attract herbivores and or pollinators, seed dispersal agents, uh, and of course we use them as flavours, fragrances, colours, scents, drugs, uh, for industrial biotechnology applications. So they're a hugely valuable resource, but they're very, very complicated. And my interest in this area started with a particular group of chemicals called triterpenes, which are one of the largest and most structurally diverse types of specialised metabolite produced by plants. And the triterpenes um, share a common pathway uh, with sterol biosynthesis, which of course is essential because sterols uh, are uh, essential components of membranes and they're also hormones. So sterols are essential, they're part of primary metabolism. And sterols are made via the mevalonate pathway here, which goes to this precursor, 2,3-oxidosqualene. And 2,3-oxidosqualene is linear, but it can be cyclized by sterol synthases. In plants, this would be cycloartanol synthase, <coughs> to make the first committed precursor uh, in the sterol pathway here, cycloartanol which can then go on and be uh, modified and turned into various sterols. Alternatively, this molecule can be cyclized to make a range of alternative products that come under the heading of specialised metabolism. Now, there are some caveats around that which we can come back to. So this is a fascinating molecule, and the enzymes that do this origami process are equally, uh, if not more so, more fascinating. And these are just a few examples of the alternative cyclization products that can be made from 2,3-oxidosqualene. And I'm going to focus uh, in a little while on this one here, which is called beta-amarin. It's a pentacyclic triterpene. It's one of the most common triterpenes found in plants. So beta-amarin happens to be very common in plants, uh, but it's also a precursor Oh, sorry, uh, before I say that, I've, I've just mentioned that these are some of the alternative cyclization products of 2,3-oxidosqualene. Uh, actually, there are an awful lot more of them out there, and these are just a few of them. So these are structures that have been reported from nature, um, and they, their structures are consistent with their being made by cyclization of 2,3-oxidosqualene. So just with this very simple precursor, we're already getting a huge amount of structural diversity. And simple triterpenes um, have important properties in their own right. For example, oleanolic acid, which is a derivative of beta-amarin, the molecule that I just mentioned to you, um, has weak anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer activity. And there has been a lot of interest in trying to make improved versions of this uh, that can be used in, for therapeutics. But of course, a molecule like this um, is pretty difficult to modify chemically, selectively, um, because um, the scaffold uh, has very little uh, functionalization to work with. So simple triterpenes are important, uh, but in plants, these molecules are often converted to far more complicated things. And here I'm just showing you a few examples of rather more complex molecules that are all made from that simple starting point, beta-amarin. Uh, and you can see that I've highlighted a few properties associated with these. So they all have this simple scaffold, but they have various other modifications. So they have oxygenations, they have sugars. Uh, here is an acyl group. And you can see that there is a lot of diversity. So diversity in the scaffold, and then all of these further modifications, and there is a whole suite uh, of enzymes that mediate this. Um, can convert these molecules into all kinds of interesting bioactives. Very few of these can actually be purchased, and there are lots of problems with accessing them from nature because you have to access the plant material. They're produced in small quantities. Uh, they're often present as complex mixtures. There are a lot of issues with trying to get hold of uh, triterpenes so that we can do systematic analysis to understand the relationship between structure and function. 
And you can see the properties listed here are diverse. This one, which I'm going to come back to, uh, happens to fluoresce bright blue because it has an N-methyl anthranilate group here. This is a very unusual property amongst the triterpenes. And as I will show you, it's been extremely useful to us. And this molecule is produced uh, only in the roots of oat, the genus Avena, and it's antifungal. Uh, it also is phytotoxic, so it's a, a natural herbicide. And then you can see down here we have another triterpene produced by P called chromosaponin 1. And this, uh, instead of being uh, phytotoxic, is actually a plant growth stimulant. So we're really interested in understanding whether those molecules act antagonistically on the same uh, pathway or whether there are different things going on. This molecule produced by legumes is associ associated with bitterness and antifeedant properties, whereas this one from licorice uh, is 50 times sweeter than sugar. And then we have various um, uh, pharmaceutical properties listed here as well. So these are just, this is just a snapshot. This is a very, very small amount of the diversity that's out there in nature. And what got me interested in this whole area is this molecule here, which is called a Venusin A1. And this is one of those stories of serendipity. And it started because I was interested in some papers published in the 1940s by a lady called Elizabeth Turner at the University of Oxford, who had seen that the tips of oat roots, Avena, fluoresce bright blue under ultraviolet light. And she made extracts from these roots, and she found that there was a substance in there which was antimicrobial. And she called this root tip glycoside because she'd shown that it was glycosylated. At the time, she didn't know the structure, which was subsequently determined, and shown to be this molecule, which has a beta amarin scaffold, the fluorescent <coughs> N-methyl anthranilate group here, and a trisaccharide chain. So this molecule is produced specifically by oat. So most of these specialised chemicals produced by plants are only produced by particular narrow taxonomic windows. So they are, that's why they're called specialised. They're also often called secondary, but the term secondary is going out of fashion because they're clearly important molecules. And I was interested, so Elizabeth <coughs> Turner in the 1940s proposed that this molecule might be protecting oats against attack by soil-borne pathogens. And I embarked on this somewhat reckless set of experiments to address this, because at the time, people were really interested in molecules produced in plants in response to pathogen attack. And this molecule is just sitting there in the soil. It's produced as part of normal growth and development. And nobody had asked at the time whether preformed chemicals might be important in protecting plants. And to me, that seemed like an obvious possibility. So we took diploid oat and we treated it with a chemical mutagen and we simply screened by putting germinating oat seedlings onto a UV transilluminator. We looked for seedlings with reduced fluorescence and this is one of them here. Clearly uh, this molecule is very complex. We expected to find many genes involved in its synthesis. At the time that we started this, nothing was known about triterpene biosynthesis for any plant species. Oats are very unusual amongst the cereals and grasses uh, in making antimicrobial triterpenes, whereas the dicotyledonous plants make a huge array of triterpenes. So this was an unusual situation in the grasses. And people were interested in why oats were making this, and other cereals, such as wheat and barley and maize, were not. So we did this mutagenesis. We got a bunch of mutants. In fact, we have nearly 100 mutants in this very complex pathway. And then we tested the mutants to see if they were compromised in disease susceptibility. And the answer was very clearly yes. So here is the wild type oat. And this has been challenged with a soil borne pathogen that causes massive disease losses on wheat. Uh, and it's resistant. But the mutants all show severe lesions and are clearly susceptible. So we had addressed Elizabeth Turner's question and we had shown um, that this molecule appears to be involved, or it is involved, in protection against soil-borne pathogens. And we would have stopped there because um, diploid oat is not a model species by any means. It's not Arabidopsis. And this is a very, very complicated molecule. But the reason why we kept going was because 
the genetics started to tell us that something <coughs> very strange was happening. The loci that we defined by mutation, but had not yet characterized, were not co-segregating when we did genetic analysis. They were sticking together. And this suggested um, that the genes for this very complex pathway were, or were genetically linked in the genome. And many years on, we've now characterized all of the genes in the pathway. Here I'm just showing five. Um, this is the gene for the first step, the second step. These are three genes for the acyl group. And these genes are physically adjacent. Those of you who work on bacteria might think this is really funny because this is 400 kilobases here. This is a big distance. But actually in plants, this is a gene-rich region. And there are no other obvious genes in between the genes that we, we find. And I should emphasize that these genes all encode entirely different types of enzymes. This is the oxidosqualine cyclase that converts 2,3-oxidosqualine to beta amarin. This is a P450 that introduces <coughs> modifications to beta amarin. This is an acyl transferase, a sugar transferase, a methyl transferase. So this is not a tandem duplication event where we have an array of genes that have been duplicated. And I can also tell you with confidence uh, that this region has not originated from microbes. It is not a horizontal gene transfer event. And I can further say, and there is a lot of evidence for this, that this cluster has evolved since oats have separated from other cereals and grasses. So something very strange is happening. Now, when we started this work, the, the general understanding was that genes for the synthesis of specialized metabolites and for other multi-step processes were scattered around the genome. But here, we have something that looks a little bit more like a bacterial operon. It's not an operon because the genes are transcribed separately, but nevertheless, they are physically clustered. Together, they make this molecule which is required for plant defense. The molecule, if you take a cross-section of an oat root, is in the epidermis. Uh, so it's in the right cell layer to provide protection. It makes sense. The genes are expressed in the roots, but not in the other parts of the plant. And when we do messenger RNA in situ hybridization, we can see that, in fact, they're also expressed in the epidermis. So these are longitudinal sections of the root. And this is where the signal is. So we have physical clustering and co-expression. This is a recently evolved pathway these genes have somehow been recruited from existing components elsewhere in the genome and assembled, I'm choosing my words carefully here, assembled into a cluster. Now, we know a lot more about this pathway, uh, which I won't go into the details of. Uh, we've characterized all of the genes and enzymes now. We've just, we haven't published on all of them. We know that the blue fluorescent molecule ends up in the vacuole. We know where a number of the proteins are. We do know that these proteins do not exist as a single multi-protein complex because we know, for example, that the acyl transferase is in the vacuole, that the early steps uh, are likely to be on the cytosolic face of the endoplasmic reticulum, and that the other intermediate steps are probably uh, cytosolic. And here is the molecule in the vacuole. So one of the very ambitious projects that we have um, is, is to see, having learnt what we have from oats, can we take these genes and engineer them into wheat and into other plant species to see if we can make antimicrobial anti triterpenes, not necessarily the blue fluorescent one exactly, uh, but to make triterpene scaffolds and modify them uh, to give antimicrobial compounds. And if we can do this, then perhaps we can prevent this dreadful soil-borne disease of wheat uh, which causes hundreds of millions of pounds of loss in yield in the UK alone per year. So this is a very ambitious project. One of the things that surprised me when I first started thinking about plant engineering is that despite all of the effort that has gone into this area since the 70s or 80s, there are very few promoters available. And there are certainly very few promoters available um, that we can have confidence uh, that they will drive coordinate gene expression. If you want to express multiple genes in the same tissue at the same time, 
there's, a, there's still a big challenge there. And we found something rather surprising, which was although when you look at our gene cluster, uh, we can come to the reasons why genes might be clustered, and I'm very interested in your views on this. But clearly one explanation, or one, one partial explanation, could be that physical clustering enables a higher level of regulation of the gene, ex of gene expression at the level of chromatin, and potentially also higher nuclear organisation. However, if we take the promoters of these genes out of this region and we hook them up to a reporter gene and we put them into other plant species, they work. <coughs> so this is oat, and here you can see fluorescence in the root tips, as I've shown you. What I, what I haven't shown you is we also see fluorescence in the lateral root initials. So this is the pattern of expression. If we hook the promoters up to a reporter, such as Gus, we get blue staining where we see expression. So in diverse plant species, such as Arabidopsis and rice and legumes, this is just with the promoter for the first gene in the oak cluster, but it's true also for the others. We see gus expression in the root tips and the lateral root initials. <coughs> in these diverse plant species, so remember that this pathway has evolved recently. It's specific to oat. And so this provides a, a further conundrum. It looks as though that the promoters for the oak cluster have somehow plugged into some sort of ancient, highly conserved root development process, which is conserved across the monocots and the dicots. It's also very useful because it means we can use these promoters in other plant species. And here they are in wheat. So this is really nice. We now have a set of um, 11 promoters that we can use to drive the expression of multiple genes in wheat roots. That's a really useful resource. We still don't quite understand how it works. Coming back to the triterpenes, I mentioned um, that 2 3 oxidosqualine could be cyclized. It can be converted into all of these different cyclization products by enzymes known as 2 3 oxidosqualine cyclases. And uh, I showed you examples of all of these diverse scaffolds. And we now know, whoops, sorry, many years on, we now know a lot more about the enzymes that make these scaffolds. We still haven't characterized very many of them. Uh, but these are some examples. The oat one is up here. Uh, interestingly, dicots make beta amarin in different ways. And then there are other enzymes that make all sorts of diverse scaffolds. So it's a very interesting group of enzymes because they take one substrate, but they're able to convert it to all of these different products. And there tends to be, most of these enzymes are specialised, some of them make multiple products. And we're beginning to learn about the cytochrome P450 enzymes that are able to oxygenate these scaffolds. So this is beginning to provide us with tools that we can use to selectively modify scaffolds in different places. And these are all beta amarin modifying cytochromes P450, uh, not just from oat, but from a whole range of other plant species. So we're putting together now, collectively, a number of groups around the world have discovered a lot of <coughs> genes and enzymes for the synthesis of triterpene scaffolds and their modification. And we're putting together a toolkit that we can use to make suites of structural variants of these molecules. So these are beta amarin modifying P450s. There are also P450s available now that make other scaffolds, which we and others have characterized. And you can see that we're building up a very powerful set of, of resources here for the modification of scaffolds, which can then be further modified enzymatically, or of course they could be modified using chemistry. And we're beginning now to learn also about uh, the, the sugar transferases, because we've had to work our way through the cyclases and then the P450s to get to the, the next step, which is glycosylation. And there are now quite a few sugar transferases uh, that put sugars onto various positions around the scaffold. And of course, glycosylation also changes uh, the, 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 the um, the, the physical and the biochemical properties of these, these molecules uh, quite markedly. One of the things that has been very helpful to us, I mean, there's a general feeling out there that uh, working with plants is extremely slow. And when you're doing genetics in oat, it is. Um, but one of the things that's really accelerated what we have been doing is this very nice transient plant expression system developed by my colleague, George Lomonosov at the John Innes Center. And what this involves um, is a very simple system uh, 
where you can take uh, your gene of interest, in this case GFP, and George accidentally discovered a number of years ago through his work on cowpea mosaic virus <laughs> that if you have a little bit of cowpea mosaic virus uh, sequence from uh, the RNA2 gene of cowpea mosaic virus inserted in front of your gene of interest, this gives a massive elevation in the amount of protein that's produced, and this effect is post-transcriptional. And so if you have your construct with your cowpea mosaic virus sequence here and a suppressor of gene silencing, P19, put these into agrobacterium, the workhorse that we use for plant transformation, you just squirt your agrobacterium into the leaves and within five days or six days you have, in this case, um, very clear expression of green fluorescent protein. And the levels of protein using this system because of these sequences are massively elevated. And so we wondered whether um, this would also work for uh, the molecules that we're interested in. And so we made constructs and we did this expression in this Nicotiana benthymiana plant, which is particularly amenable uh, to transient expression. And here we've got GC traces, and this is uh, an extract from an empty vector control leaf. This is an extract from a leaf expressing our beta amarin synthase, and this is a peak of beta amarin. So this is the black scaffold here. And then here we have the second step in our oat pathway, which is a very interesting cytochrome P450, which we knew modified beta amarin, but we weren't sure exactly how. And when we co-infiltrate the genes for these two constructs, the beta amarin peak goes right down, and this peak comes up, and we were able to easily get enough to purify and determine the structure using NMR. Interestingly, although I won't go into this in any detail, this P450 is able to modify two rings on this structure. It's a very interesting enzyme. So this then was a proof of concept. And we've now gone on, taken our triterpene toolkit. Uh, you'll hear more from Jim about uh, the common plant syntax and the ways in which we've been um, getting our DNA synthesized and formatted so that we can uh, mix and match and exchange with others. So we have a toolkit of genes and enzymes for triterpene synthesis modification to make known and novel molecules. And we can now play with these. We, we put them into the, uh, the Nicotiana leaf expression system. And within five or six days, we get our answer. We know which enzymes will do what. So this is very, very rapid, very quick, very powerful. <coughs> and we've been using it to assemble um, multiple steps in, in the synthesis of triterpenes to make very complex molecules. And uh, we've been able to easily make several hundred milligrams, uh, which is useful. It's very useful for doing bioassays. And recently, somebody in the lab has now made a gram of beta amarin. So we can go up to gram levels. The question now is, can we go down to high throughput robotics? Uh, and you'll see how that can be even more powerful fairly soon. Now, I mentioned this phenomenon of gene clustering, and I said it was unusual, it was surprising. And at the time we found the oat gene, gene <coughs> cluster, there was only one other example of a gene cluster for a specialised metabolic pathway in plants. And that had been reported by Alphonse Giel in Munich, who was working on maize, uh, on molecules known as benzoxazinoids which are also implicated in plant defence. That was the only other example. That was about 15 years ago now. <coughs> but the, sorry, <coughs> the general view, uh, the, until quite recently, uh, has been that genes for multi-step pathways are dispersed around the genome. And the anthocyanin pathway in maize is a great example of this. And the genes for anthocyanin biosynthesis are on different chromosomes in maize and are used to follow... Uh, the segregation of genes in, in genetics, it's well known. You could say, well, are anthocyanins really specialised because plants, all plants make anthocyanins? Carotenoid genes similarly are dispersed. Carotenoids are also uh, very widely distributed. Nevertheless, there are examples of other specialised metabolic pathways, for example, for glucosinolates in brassicas, uh, that are not clustered. So we wanted to find out how common this clustering phenomenon might be. There was the original maize cluster, the oat cluster. So we went to Arabidopsis because at the time there weren't many uh, plant genome sequences available and the Arabidopsis genome uh, was very high quality. 
And we did a very crude mining experiment. We simply looked for genes that were predicted to encode 2,3-oxidosqualene cyclases. So genes that, were, that looked like they might be able to take 2,3-oxidosqualene and turn it into one of those cyclic products that I've mentioned. And in the Arabidopsis genome, there are 13 genes uh, that belong to that family. One of them is required for the synthesis of cycloartanol, which is, as I said, uh, the precursor for essential sterols. Uh, but the others all make diverse products, and that's been shown in yeast. So they're not involved in essential sterile biosynthesis. This is one of those genes. When we look around that gene in the genome, we see that its neighbours are genes that are predicted to encode two very different types of cytochrome P450 that have not arisen by tandem duplication. They're very different. And an acyl transferase. And we also saw that these genes were very tightly co-expressed uh, in the available gene expression data. So this looked like a candidate metabolic gene cluster. And so Ben Field, who was in the lab at the time, um, did some very careful analysis using uh, mutant lines that were blocked in these various steps, and also using overexpression lines and silenced lines and biochemistry. And he was able to show that these genes did indeed form a pathway. And this um, was, we, we called it rather mischievously, the first example of an operon-like gene cluster in Arabidopsis. It's not an operon, as I say, but the point is these genes uh, are not tandem duplicates. They encode steps in a pathway. They're co-expressed. So they have operon-like features. <clears throat> so we and others have then gone on to, uh, to predict and validate other um, metabolic clusters in Arabidopsis. Uh, and there's a second one that we found. Uh, the first one was for the synthesis and modification of thalianol, which is a triterpene. And then another one for the synthesis and modification of manarol, another triterpene. I should say at this point that although the oat avenosin pathway and the Arabidopsis triterpene pathway, which I've just shown you, are both triterpene pathways, there is compelling evidence that these pathways have evolved independently of each other. And if anyone wants to know more, I can tell you afterwards. So this would appear then to suggest that triterpene pathways may be predisposed to clustering. We found a second triterpene cluster in Arabidopsis, the Marnerol cluster, and through careful analysis and looking at phylogenetics and intron exon patterns, we were able to put together this model, which um, may be a little bit too generous. I mean, we, it's possible there was an ancestral gene pair that, that was the foundation for both of these clusters, but we can't be sure of that. And this contained an oxidosqualene cyclase and potentially also a particular type of cytochrome P450. So conceivably then, this duplicated. But nevertheless, what has happened since then is that other genes have been recruited into these regions. And these clustered pathways both make entirely different products. So this is a possible scenario uh, for the ways in which, in Arabidopsis at least, <laughs> these clusters may uh, form. Now, since the maize and the oat story and the Arabidopsis work, um, others were discovering other clusters in other plant species. Uh, work from Ruben Peters' lab and Professor Yamane's lab in, uh, in Tokyo uh, had, had led to discovery of uh, clusters in rice, again, for the production of defence-related compounds, diterpenes. And this figure, which you won't be able to see because it's too small, is from a review that we published at the beginning of last year. And this shows clusters um, from a growing number of different plant species for different types of chemical. <coughs> Excuse me. And this, this just gives you an example um, of, of some of those. So here we have the, um, the oat compound. So these molecules are all produced by clustered pathways. Here is the maize compound, Arabidopsis. Uh, there have been clusters reported for uh, the synthesis of um, anti-nutritional compounds in tomato, medicinal drugs in poppy. These are the rice diterpene clusters. Interestingly, the cyanogenic glycosides, which have traditionally been thought of as the most ancient and highly conserved group of plant natural products, and these are sporadically distributed across the plant kingdom, um, it turns out that those clusters, and this is work from a group in Copenhagen, uh, sorry, those pathways are clustered in lotus, in sorghum, in cassava. But importantly, those clusters have arisen independently. So 
Um, independent evolution, then, of genes that give rise to cyanogenic glycosides in diverse plant species. So the reason for clustering, now depending on your background, you may have different explanations for this. This is clearly a non-random organisation of genes in the genome. Plant genomes generally contain around 30,000 genes. So to have genes right next to each other that are not tandem duplicates, that are delivering these beneficial pathways um, is definitely not random. And as I mentioned earlier, um, physical clustering has the potential to facilitate higher level regulation at the level of chromatin, at the level of nuclear organisation. And I've shown you that the, the genes in the oak cluster have this very, very tight expression pattern. In Arabidopsis, this is in silico gene expression data. These are the four genes of the thalianol cluster. And you can see their expression patterns across different tissues is very similar. When we get to the edges, to genes that are not involved in this pathway, the expression pattern is different. So these are windows of, of co-expression. <clears throat> we showed some years ago, using DNA fluorescence in situ hybridization with the oat cluster, um, that if we take probes for the, gene, the first gene in the pathway and the second gene in the pathway, in green and red here, so you can see this is looking at DNA now, you can see that in the epidermis, these signals are quite strung out, they're quite extended and of course the pathway is active in the epidermis whereas in the cortical cells where the pathway is not expressed the signals are more discrete and it was possible to actually quantify uh, these these differences so this is <coughs> descriptive but it suggests that chromat chromatin decondensation is associated with expression of this pathway in oat we've gone on to do a lot of work in arabidopsis where the resources are much better uh, for looking at uh, chromatin modification, the, the effects of various uh, modifications on uh, cluster expression. And a picture is emerging now, uh, both in Arabidopsis and from what we've been able to do with other plant species where the resources are available. Um, so in Arabidopsis, for example, genome-wide chromatin immunoprecipitation has enabled regions to be identified that are marked with... Uh, a histone modification, this is histone 3 K27 trimethylation, and this is a, usually a repressive marking. Uh, and uh, these clusters have a very, very discrete and localized uh, marking of this H3 K27 trimethylation. And uh, this is generally installed by the polycomb complex. So this is associated with inactivity, um, but we also see that um, in tissues where clusters are active, uh, we have exchange of uh, the histone 2A protein with histone H2AZ, uh, which again um, has been associated with poising and with, with, um, with readiness uh, of genes, for example, in yeast, to enable rapid expression in response to environmental change. So we still have a lot to learn about this, but I should also say that while in animals, uh, regions of contiguous marking of genes with H3K27 trimethylation is well established. In plants, it isn't. So there has been a lot of work in plants on polycomb-mediated regulation of gene expression, most notably uh, in the context of plant development. But these genes are generally isolated. They're not contiguous. And it transpires that we can use these markings as an additional tool to try to mine genomes um, to discover new pathways. And here you can see these are the genes in the thalianol pathway in Arabidopsis. And this is the histone 3 K27 trimethylation marking, which is very clearly significant and pronounced. And we can actually go through data from the Arabidopsis genome. We can look for windows of co-expression. We can also look for windows of H3 K27 trimethylation in tissues where um, the pathways are not active. And we can use that to find um, new candidate pathways. Similarly, I mentioned that H2AZ, this alternative histone 2 variant, is associated with pathway activation. And we can use mutants um, to look for windows in the Arabidopsis genome where we see a very clear effect on transcript levels uh, of, of cluster components. So this is the thalianol cluster. This is in the wild type line, this dotted line. But in a mutant that is lacking H2AZ, you can see that the transcript levels go right down, and there's this very discrete window. This is very striking. 
similarly for the Marnerol cluster. And this is a new cluster um, that we've recently discovered and that others have also done some work on. And this is a much larger cluster and it's very, very pronounced. So we're beginning to learn about the features of these clusters, not only in terms of the genes uh, within them, but also these kinds of markings. And this can all be fed in uh, to what we hope ultimately will turn into a machine for mining plant genomes, uh, for discovering new pathways and chemistries. So the arguments for clustering, I've talked about <coughs> co-expression. I've also told you that these clusters um, have either been shown to make compounds that uh, provide protection against pests and pathogens, or they're likely to have some role in survival in the environment. So it's generally accepted that these specialised metabolic pathways are serving a useful purpose in nature. So if you have assembled good combinations of genes that together are able to make a protective molecule, presumably once you've done that, you want to co-inherit that gene set together in order to be able to continue to make the molecule. So that leads to another theory that has been proposed, which is the co-inheritance theory. Um, on top of that, we also know that in some cases, if we interfere with these pathways, with mutants or with overexpression of, of pathway genes, then we get elevated levels of intermediates accumulating. And this can have clearly detrimental effects. Um, not always, but in some cases. So in oat, for example, failure to add on a glucose to the trisaccharide chain of the triterpene leads to a very sick root phenotype. And here inside the wild type, this is normal wild type root cell. This is inside the mutant. The epidermal cell layer is very distorted. There are these big membranous sacs. And this is callow staining. Uh, an accumulation of callows in this way is typical uh, of, a, of a response to uh, toxicity. And in fact, if we combine this mutation with a mutation in the first step in the pathway, uh, we lose the ability to make the intermediate and we restore the normal root phenotype although clearly we don't make the molecule. So this is a toxic intermediate effect. Similarly, in Arabidopsis, if we mess with the Thalianol cluster or the Marnerol cluster, we can have these clearly detrimental effects on plant growth. So if you interfere with clusters, you not only lose the ability to make a protective molecule, you can also uh, generate molecules that are very bad, that, that cause <coughs> serious effects on growth and development. So... This is very simplistic, and as I said, it depends on your background which of these you might jump to. And for the population genetics in the audience, geneticists in the audience, there's another level, obviously. So co-expression, co-inheritance, toxic intermediates, these are not mutually exclusive arguments, and they're also not the full story. And certainly, we don't always see toxic effects when we interfere with pathways. And I think we can learn something so um, Victor's comment at the beginning of the meeting about separating out where do biological systems, biological objects come from and how do they work. To me, that's a bit of a blur. I mean, you can't recreate evolution, obviously. Um, but I think we're getting glimpses into things, into what might have happened in terms of cluster assembly and how clusters work uh, through these kinds of experiments. So... This issue then of how do these pathways assemble, evolve is a bad word, in this, <laughs> certainly in this, in this forum, how do they assemble? And uh, the answer is we still don't really know. I've shown you a model from Arabidopsis. Uh, we have a gene encoding the first step in the pathway, um, which makes the scaffold, or at least is the first committed step in the pathway. And then we have genes encoding enzymes that modify the product of the first enzyme. And we call these tailoring enzymes by analogy with microbial systems. And these are things like cytochromes, P450, sugar transferases, acyl transferases, methyl transferases. So often the gene for the first step in the pathway, as I've shown you for the triterpenes, um, has almost certainly been recruited from primary metabolism in the case of the oat and the Arabidopsis triterpenes from the sterol pathway. But then it has diverged, it has acquired a new function and also a different expression pattern. Somehow then, this gene has seeded the formation of a cluster. And again, I'm using my words very carefully here. Um, but there is lots of evidence to indicate that these clusters are forming de novo 
in plant genomes. And this is where, if the mathematicians have any ideas, I would be really grateful to, to know them. Um, so I've shown you examples of uh, toxicity when you accumulate intermediates, but also some other very subtle effects, and this is one of them. So going back to our oats, this is the, the wild-type oat line. This is a mutant that is blocked in the first step in the pathway. It, it's not able to make uh, the beta amarin that is the precursor for the, the rest of the pathway, <coughs> at least not in significant quantity. This is a late pathway enzyme. This is the acyl transferase. These roots all look normal. Um, we noticed, and we're growing these seedlings on big square Petri dishes, um, and we had to do that to see this effect, because initially we were growing them on small Petri dishes. We kept thinking the roots of this mutant looked shorter, but it was a bit variable. And here you can clearly see that these roots are shorter. And these mutants are blocked here. So they're accumulating 40-fold more beta amarin than the wild type. So this is a beta amarin mutant that is blocked in the first step in the pathway. There's still a basal level. There's a very low level of beta amarin detectable in the wild type and a trace detectable here. But these mutants are accumulating 40-fold more beta amarin, which, as I said, is a common plant metabolite. And when we look closely at what's going on in these roots, this is, these are the root hairs. This is the wild type. These are mutants blocked in the first step and the roots look normal. These are our SAD2 mutants, the mutants that are accumulating beta amarin, and the roots are super hairy. These are two independent mutants. This is an intermediate mutant that is partially blocked. So somehow, accumulation of elevated levels of beta amarin is triggering this super hairy root phenotype. And when we looked at this very closely, we saw something really interesting. So this is patterning in the wild type root epidermis. This is before the root hairs emerge. We're looking at the, the meristem. The long grey cells are the cells that will not give rise to root hair cells. The pink cells are shorter, and they are the cells that will give rise to root hairs. In the wild type, we can detect low levels of beta amarin. In the mutant, we detect, as I say, a lot more. And what we're seeing is actually a change in cell specification. This is really important. This is happening very early on. When the cells are deciding what they're going to be, they're being told before they form uh, that they're going to be root hair cells. And this is why we have this super hairy root phenotype. So this is a bit more like a plant growth hormone effect. So when you start to think about all of these things we're seeing, the things that intermediates do, trying to make sense of it, it's a big challenge. But there are definitely some really interesting things coming through this. So super hairy roots at some point in time may actually have been an, an advantage. Maybe you take a cycloartinol synthase gene, you duplicate it, it acquires a new function, the ability to make beta amarin. It's expressed in the roots. Uh, and maybe that was a good thing. Um, and we're now looking to see whether these mutants have enhanced uh, biotic and abiotic stress tolerance. As an aside, we also see interesting, more subtle effects uh, with other situations as well. So, for example, I've shown you about toxic effects uh, with the thalianol pathway in Arabidopsis, but we also see some more subtle effects where if we accumulate elevated levels of thalianol in the roots, we actually see longer roots. If you want to make longer roots and make a fitter plant, that's quite a useful thing to know about. And in legumes, which form symbiosis with nitrogen-fixing bacteria, there is a different triterpene called lupiol, and there is a lupiol synthase that is expressed in nodules. Uh, and when we silence it, we see a window of clearly elevated uh, nodule formation. So lupiol appears to be suppressing uh, nodule formation. So we don't understand all of this, but I'm just saying there's stuff going on. And it gets more complicated. Um, so these, these are just more examples of, of different effects that we can see when we tinker uh, with uh, clustered <coughs> pathways. So uh, just before I finish, I want to tell you a little bit more about what we've been doing in a more bigger picture way, because I hope you can see how once this is all sorted out and automated, uh, this could be incredibly powerful, um, the whole clustering phenomenon. And uh, one of the things that we've been doing, this is with Alex Butinov, uh, who is a bioinformatician based in Russia, is taking multiple 
uh, plant species, in this case 17 species for which the genome sequences are available, we focused on the terpene family. So the terpenes include the triterpenes, but also a whole load of other types of terpenes that I, I won't go into. But it's, it is a massive family of diversity in plants. And what Alex did was he mined these genomes for all terpene synthase genes. So these are the engines of, of um, generating di diverse scaffolds. And he also mined them for all cytochrome P450 uh, genes. And then he asked, using a sliding window approach, how often he found a terpene synthase gene in proximity to a P450 gene relative to what would be expected by chance. And the answer was very often. And so we were able, we've classified all of the terpene synthase genes according to uh, the nomenclature and all of the P450 genes. And uh, what we can start to see is that there is a clear skewing, there's a clear tendency of P450 genes to be physically linked within 50 kilobases, which in plants is close, to terpene synthase genes. And we can also look at the patterns that are emerging in terms of the types of cytochrome P450 genes that tend to be associated with terpene synthases. And when Alex did this, he found the known examples of terpene synthase genes that have already been reported. I've told you about the diterpene clusters from rice. He also found uh, the, the steroidal glycoalkaloid cluster from tomato, the Arabidopsis clusters, and so on, but also a whole <coughs> bunch of other candidate clusters. One of the things he did, which was very interesting in terms of trying to get more insight into how these pathways evolve, was he took a couple of the major pairings, the major groupings of terpene synthases <coughs> and P450s. And this is a little bit, just bear with me, this is um, easy to understand once you, uh, once you get it. So he took these pairs of terpene synthases and P450s, and he did sequence similarity searches. So he took a terpene synthase within a pair and asked which one was the most closely related terpene synthase in the other pairs. And then he did the same for the P450 partner of that terpene synthase. And what he found was something very interesting, which was that in the dicots, the terpene synthase, that, that um, when you found the, the one that was most closely related to it, its P450 partner was also most closely related to the P450 partner of that terpene synthase. It, in other words, that's suggesting an iterative duplication of pairs of terpene synthases and P450 genes. That was not the case in the monocots. Something strange is happening there. So it's as if there is a microsyntony in the dicots. And um, this is kind of the opposite way around to the way that it's normally thought of. I've spoken to a lot of genomics experts, and they, they don't know uh, how to explain this. And we're only looking at this on the basis of terpene synthases, not the whole uh, organization of the genome. But it suggests that there is microsyntenic duplication in the dicots. And that would be consistent with our Arabidopsis hypothesis for the thalionol and monoryl clusters. But in the monocots, it's all chopping and changing and de novo combinations. He also looked at all of the, um, the, the genes within these pairs and compared them to genes across the genome, looked at the frequency of transposable elements in the flanking regions, because you might expect that transposable elements would play a role in moving genes around. And as we might expect, he found that there were significantly more transposable elements in the flanking regions of the genes within these pairs than in uh, the ones that were not paired. And uh, we then went on and took some of these new candidate clusters that Alex had found, um, and we validated them experimentally. And this is work with Ruben Peters in Iowa. So this was a predicted cluster for diterpene synthesis in Castor. Uh, this was another cluster in Arabidopsis, again for triterpenes, and this is a cluster from cucumber. So uh, again, it's more grist for the mill. It's more um, a very powerful way of finding new chemistries. So in summary, um, I'd just like to say that um, I've talked about examples of these metabolic gene clusters in plants for the synthesis of diverse chemicals. We don't yet know what the balance will be of pathways where the genes are dispersed relative to those that are clustered. Uh, nevertheless, clustering is very useful for mining genomes to discover new <coughs> pathways and chemistries. Um, we can look at these clusters uh, to try to understand what their defining features are uh, and to understand how they work. 
And then uh, we need to know whether we can edit them down, we don't know whether we can, to make minimal gene clusters, uh, which will make it much easier to move these pathways around, certainly in plants, and make synthetic gene clusters. And one of the things we've done, for example, is to take the promoters from the oat cluster, which you will remember are expressed exquisitely in the root tips, and we've used those to drive the expression of a three-gene pathway for the synthesis of cyanogenic glycosides in Arabidopsis roots. And this opens up opportunities to start to tailor the rhizosphere by making designer chemicals in plant roots. And with that, I'd like to finish and just draw your attention to the many people um, who have contributed to this work and also the funding sources. And I think you'll hear more about Open Plant from Jim in the next talk. Thank you.